So welcome back everyone to the afternoon session. Well, technically the second morning session. Uh, today, Professor Lovelace will talk about discontinuous Galakin methods. So let's get started and I'll hand the mic over to him. Okay, welcome back everybody. So last time I tried to set the stage and say why we need next generation numerical relativity codes. Why the codes that we've built so far, um, while they've been successful so far, why they're not, they're not they might not be good enough for next generation detectors. We need a lot more accuracy in our gravitational wave, waves that come out of these codes than what the current codes today are able to provide. Now, the one of the next generation codes that's out there and the one I'm gonna be focusing on this week is Spectre. Spectre uses two new ideas that the older codes don't use. Task-based parallelism, which you're gonna get some experience with after the C++ part of the tutorials um, uh, in, the, in the tutorial sections. And the other big idea is discontinuous Galerkin. And I want to walk you through what discontinuous Galerkin is all about. And this means going through some math. The math is gonna come down to saying, how do we, how do we turn a set of partial differential equations into ordinary differential equations? I'm gonna be focusing specifically on initial value problem equations. So today what I wanna do is set the stage of what kind of equations we're going to solve and give you a feel for what kind of systems of equations I'm gonna be talking about. And starting with some equations uh, that you can picture to have some idea of the physics of what they might be. And once we work our way towards the most general form of equations I want to deal with, then I'll, we'll do it once and for all. We'll go through the derivation of, okay, how do you reduce this system with the discontinuous Galerkin spatial approximation into something that you can just uh, solve as in a set of ordinary differential equations on a, on a computer? So that's sort of the plan. So today I'm gonna talk about, oh, I don't wanna cross that line there. So I'm gonna talk about systems of partial differential equations. And these systems are going to be first order. First order in time, first order in space. So let me give you some intuition about why this is the kind of equations that we want to be talking about. So to start out with, let me just write down an equation for you here. Zero is partial rho, partial t plus del dot, oh, let's say rho v. Have any of you seen an equation like this before? Do any of you recognize it? Continuity equation, exactly so. And what does the continuity equation mean? Conservation, exactly. I'm not going to take the time to write out the math, but if you integrate both sides over some volume, this is gonna say, the change in mass inside that volume is just equal to the flux going in and out of the boundary. So this is something you meet, um, if instead of rho v, this was just current density, you meet this in electrodynamics, you meet this in fluid dynamics. Okay, so this is one sort of equation. And the thing to notice is that it's got a time derivative in it. So this is gonna be an initial value problem. We'll have some initial data, and then the, the, the solution will involve evolving it through time. The other thing to notice is the de only derivative in here is a divergence. Now, I'm, this is sort of the more familiar notation, but I'm gonna be switching over to doing derivatives in a, sort of this, a, I think a similar notation to what, what Harold was doing. So let me rewrite this equation as zero equals partial sub T of rho plus partial sub I of rho VI. Now, um, just to save, I'm not very good at writing partials anyway, so just to not have to write those so much, it's a little more compact. I'm gonna write derivatives with just a partial and a subscript. Partial sub i is like saying partial partial x or partial partial y or partial partial z. Whenever I have repeated indices throughout this lecture and throughout the week, they are summed over. So this is the Einstein summation convention. So i could be x or y or z, and since there's two of them, they are sums, and that's where the, the divergence comes from. So just to be clear about the, 
the notation up front. Um, that's, that's one of the equations that I'm gonna be talking about. Okay, now why did I start here? It turns out that, um, that equations where, that are representing a conserved quantity, like here, the mass density and fluid dynamics, those turn out to be just the form of the equations that you want to use if you're going to be solving a system of equations for hydrodynamics or even magnetohydrodynamics or even the, the matter part of general relativistic magnetohydrodynamics. This is, uh, if you have a system of equations like this, these equations are in uh, uh, what you could call like flux balanced form or flux cons conservative form. So in general, you might have a system of equations. This is just one. What if you had a system of equations? So let's go ahead and write down a system of equations like this. And actually, I'm going to want to keep this one around. So I'll write it over here. So imagine you had a system where you have partial T. I'm going to use Greek indices to label the variables I'm solving for. So you sub zero might be rho, it might be the mass density, you sub one might have to do with some kind of momentum density or whatever. Um, when you saw the hydrodynamic stuff last week, those, those, those kinds of variables that you would solve for. So alpha is, is not a space time or spatial index, it's just a label. So I don't have to write out n copies of the equations. Okay. And then there's a divergence term, which will be partial i. And each term can have its own thing here. I mean, here, rho vi, that's the flux term for the mass density, but it might be different for some other variable. So I'm just going to call that some vector, and it's different for each equation. So it also gets an alpha label. And then, now this equation here uh, doesn't have any additional terms, but I'm going to say we're allowed to have source terms, which are terms that don't involve derivatives. And all of this is equal to zero. So the point is, these are the only terms with derivatives in them, the F, the fluxes. So, the, so these are the fluxes. This is what I mean by the source term. And then this is the time derivative term. These are allowed to depend on, these can depend on, the U alphas, but not their derivatives. Okay, so you could imagine having a set of equations like this. And in hydrodynamics, that's exactly the set of equations that you want. So I wanted to start there before we start going off and doing all the, the math to, to turn this into a set of ordinary differential equations with one of the kinds of physical setups that you're gonna want. Now, there's a second, there's a second kind of equation that I want to show you. But before we get there, um, let me just point out one thing. Sometimes in the literature, you'll see things like this. I don't know exactly how to pronounce this squiggle equals, equals sign. Maybe, maybe you could say zero is kind of equal to partial T U alpha plus the divergence of the fluxes, but forget the source terms. This is called the principal part. So um, the principal part is just the derivative terms. And sometimes you'll see that used, you can use that to show some properties about the, uh, about the system. That, that might come back later, but just in case I say that by accident, I wanted you to know what that was. It's just throwing away these terms that are algebraic and don't have derivatives on them. Okay, so before we get to the next equation, I wanted to remind you if anything doesn't make sense, if you have any questions, if you can't read my writing or my writing's too small or anything like that, please don't hesitate to interrupt. Are there any questions so far? Oh, what are the ABCD cards? So we're gonna vote with these. Does anybody not have one of these from yesterday? If anyone needs one, please just come on down and pick one up. <laughs> okay. So this is the first sort of example equation. We're gonna spend more time on another equation. So let's get started with this one. Now I'm gonna write this in the new notation and then I'm gonna ask you if you recognize it. So all this, I'm gonna hang on to this one, this uh, a continuity equation. What about this one? 
partial T squared of G is equal to del squared G. Now the notation might not be what you're used to, but what equation is this? It's the wave equation, yes. Now I called the wave amplitude G, which is sort of unusual because um, if you take the Einstein equations of general relativity, you can write them in a way that looks a lot like the wave equation, where instead of the wave amplitude in GR, you would have, instead of this G, it would become the space-time metric. You would just stick some tensor indices on it. So uh, even though this is a wave amplitude, normally you'd call it psi or something, just to remind you that we're really doing this as a simple, simplified version of the equations you want to solve for relativity, I'm calling it G. It's the wave equation. And I guess I didn't mean to write del squared, but that's fine. I'm going to rewrite that in our usual notation as well, del i, del i. So this is just the square of the, of the Laplacian. Now, this equation is different from the flux equation because it's not first order. It's a second order equation. This is also an initial value problem. You have some time derivatives, so you'll have some initial data, and then you'll evolve them forward in time. Okay. So why did I say first order equations when a lot of the equations you care about in physics are second order? Well, it turns out, um, like I think Thomas mentioned last week, at least, at least to some degree, you can always reduce second order equations to a set of first order equations. And that's true, not just for time, like what uh, Thomas did last week, but also for space. So I'm going to show you how to reduce this to something that only has first derivatives, just like this version of the uh, of a set of continuity equations, if you like, or a set of generalized continuity equations. This is equations that are are, are fluxes. Okay. So in order to get this equation, which I wrote in initially in a more familiar form, into a form like this, it's going to turn into a set of equations that might not look as familiar, or may maybe they have if you've seen this before. So that's the first thing we're going to do. So we've got a problem here. We've got a second time derivative. What can you do to get rid of it and just have first time derivatives? Any, any guesses or something you might try? Some gimmick to rewrite the equation is just one time derivative instead of two? Yeah, exactly. Just make a new variable. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to make a new variable, pi, and pi, capital pi, we're going to define as just minus the time derivative of the wave amplitude, g. So we're just doing minus the, the minus sign is just going to make the final form of the equations have plus signs because plus signs are a little bit nicer, but it's, it is just an arbitrary convention. We're making up a variable. We can define it however we like. And that's fine because now if we plug that definition in here, this is really just the first derivative of pi. All right, so that's going to let us get rid of the, that's going to let us get rid of one of these time derivatives. But now we also have a second order spatial derivative. We'd like to get rid of those too. Now, what should we do about that? I've sort of been writing indices up and down, but this is the wave equation in flat space. So actually, that doesn't matter for now. Indices can go up and down however you like, but when they're repeated, you're still summing over them. All right. So what are we going to do about this? Well, we can do the same thing. We'll make a new variable or a set of three variables, technically one for each component of this. Now, if, if this thing is the divergence, if I were to just, if someone were to just come up to you, off the, uh, come up to you from walking down the road and say, here's, um, here's partial sub IG. What is this? What kind of a vector operation is this? Yeah, it's just the gradient. All right. So we'll make a new variable or a set of three variables for the X, Y, Z components, capital Phi, and capital Phi is defined as just the gradient. All right. So now what we can do is we can start trying to combine these to get a set of equations with only first derivatives. So what's the first What's, what's a way to get one equation, one of those three equations? 
What's the next step? We want to take these definitions and use them. So how do we use them to get a set of first order equations? One thing you could do is take that pi, yep, yeah, and plug it in here. So let's try that. Let's try that. So I want to write the wave equation in some place I can hang on to it too. So let's see. Oh, whatever. We'll, we'll rewrite it if we need to. So one equation is going to be partial sub t of pi, capital pi, because that's the second derivative here. And that's going to be, well, I'm going to bring this term over to the other side so everything's equal to zero. And then I want to do minus partial i phi i. Is that what I want? No. Oh, there, so I heard someone say minus. Yes, because I define pi as minus partial t. There's a minus sign there as well. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Uh, it's always harder to do math at a board in front of everybody. So please just let me know if you see any other little silly mistakes like that. Okay. So now we've got this term. We've brought this over to the other side as well. And that's equal to what? Yeah, just zero. Okay. So that's one of our equations. Now, we need another equation. We need an equation. Let's see. We've got an equation for the time derivative of pi. And you know what? Minus signs are annoying. So let's just cancel those out. That's one of our equations. This tells us how pi changes. We need an equation to tell us how our other variables change. Our variables are. And so let's see. Do we have an equation for the time derivative of the wave amplitude itself? It's already right here. So let's just bring that down here. Partial T G plus pi. That's equal to zero. Is the, are these two equations enough to solve for all, the, all of our variables? Well, I guess that's a question. So let me ask you the first voting question of the of the day here, which is the question is how many variables does the scalar wave system have? And the choices are going to be one, two, five. So let's think about that question for a minute and then we'll vote with the voting cards. If anyone doesn't have one and needs one, you can come on down and grab one. The variables, by variables, I mean the things we're going to solve for. All right. Would anyone like more time to think about it before we vote? In how many dimensions? We're going to be doing three spatial, spatial dimensions. Okay. Unless anyone wants more time, prepare your votes and hold up your votes and let's see what happens. Okay. Whoa, there was a big range of opinion. Put your votes down. Can turn to someone near you, convince them why, how, what the variables are, how many of them there are. And then after we vote again and figure it out, We'll make a list and we'll write down what the variables actually are. We'll take about a minute for this. Yeah. 
Okay, I heard some good discussion, but let's come back together and see if the room came to a consensus. So prepare your votes one more time and hold up your votes. Okay. You may put your votes down. There was a bit of a shift in the right direction this time, but it's still, there's kind of a rainbow of opinion about this question. So let's make sure we figure this out because the number of equations we need is the same as the number of variables we have. So let's figure out what our variables u alpha actually are. So I'll write that here. U alpha for the scalar wave is gonna be the set of all the variables that we have. And I'm just gonna guess that that's enough room. We'll see, maybe it's too much, maybe it's too little. What's one of the variables that we're gonna solve for here? I heard a couple different answers. What's one of them? G, yeah, G is definitely one of the variables. What's another one? Five, okay, so we got at least two. And what's another variable? Yeah, the three components of phi sub i, exactly so. Phi x, phi y, and phi z. So this question, the way I posed it, I mean, I think one reason there was a split was if you wanna, do you think of these as separate things or as one thing? If you think of the phi sub i as one thing, then the correct answer would be three. But if you think of them as separate components, which is how I'm gonna think of it here, because on a computer, you're solving for separate, separate uh, numbers, I, I would say five. There's five, there's five uh, fields we have to, have to solve for, if you wanna think of it that way. I mean, technically these are all part of one thing, but numerically we can think of this as five. But anyway, those are the variables we have to solve for. Do we have enough differential equations between these two to solve for all of them? No. We have an equation for how pi changes and an equation for how t changes. We need an equation for how the phi's change. And in fact, I'm just gonna write this as phi x. I'll just write them out. Phi y. How? How do we get them? Yeah, there's a symmetry involving partial derivatives. So what we're gonna to need to do is we're gonna to need to take this equation right here and take a time derivative of both sides. So let's do that. I have some wasted space I didn't use here. So let's just do that right here. So let's take partial t phi sub i, and that's going to be equal to partial t of partial i of g. Now, What's the, next, what's the next step I should do here? Any guesses? I think I even heard someone say the right idea earlier. Yep, partial derivatives commute, flip them around. That's equal to partial i of partial t of g. Yeah, and partial t of g, what's that equal to? Nope, minus pi. It's equal to minus pi. So this is partial i, pi with a minus sign. Okay, so partial t of phi i is equal to minus partial i, it's, it's equal to minus the gradient of pi. So let's bring that over to the other side and that means partial t of phi i plus the gradient of pi, that's zero. All right, and that completes our system. So let's take the specific examples, partial t of phi x, I shouldn't have written all those equal signs. That was a mistake. Plus what is equal to zero? Partial x of pi plus partial y of pi plus partial z of pi. Okay, so the actual equations that we need to solve I'm gonna draw a box around them. These are the set of initial value equations we need to solve. But this is not the whole system of equations. This is only the system of equations if this definition is true. So there's actually another equation in here. So I'm going to draw it this way. And the other equation, 
is CI, which is defined as, which, which order am I gonna write this? Um, let me not do it that way. I think we're done with that voting question. So we also have to have that this equation is true. So in particular, partial I of G minus phi I had better be equal to zero. So I'm going to make a definition and call this left-hand side the constraint C sub I. C sub I has to be zero or else this set of equations, it's a fine set of equations to evolve, but it's not the wave equation. It's just like in electrodynamics, you could say partial T of E and partial T of B. So in, 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 you know, those are only two of Maxwell's equations. You can evolve what are those Maxwell equations for E and B just fine, but unless del dot B is zero and del dot E is, um, it's rho if you're not in vacuum. Unless these are true, these don't depend on time, but unless they're true, evolving these equations is not evolving the actual system you want. So these are called constraints. So what you wanna do is make sure your initial data satisfies this constraint. And then as you evolve, you've gotta make sure whatever you do, this constraint stays zero. Now that might seem easy. It turns out you can prove if that constraint starts out exactly zero, it will stay exactly zero, so you're good. The problem is what if it starts out at 10 to the minus 15 because you're doing it on a computer to some approximation? Well, for this set of equations, it turns out it's not the end of the world, but um, I may show you later how you can modify the equations to deal with that and, and to keep the, these uh, constraints small. But for now, I just want you to be aware that there is another equation that had better be true, even though it's not part of the system we're evolving. Those are the constraints. Okay. So that is the scalar wave system so far. I have another voting question for you, but before we get there, um, does anybody have any, any questions? Yes. Oh, how did I get the constraint equation? I took this definition of phi and just brought this over to the other side and said partial IG minus phi I had better be zero because that's how I defined phi to be. So that's where this came from. And then I just gave it a name. And I gave it a name. I mean, it might seem trivial because since I defined this this way, shouldn't this always be true? But numerically, this might start out kind of zero and then you gotta be careful to make sure it doesn't become very much not zero. There's an analogous thing that happens in general relativity. With just the wave equation, it turns out, and maybe I'll show it later, the constraints, if they start out non-zero, they'll stay at the same value they were at. But in general relativity, there are terms that would make them grow exponentially as you do your time evolution. So that's why I made a big deal about it. Does that answer your question? Great question. Other questions? So, yes. You, in the you just put that, uh, this wave equation. Yes. The constituents and initial value. Yes. What about the continuity? Is it, is it like a boundary value problem? Good question. Is this a, a boundary value problem or an initial value problem? I am thinking of both of these as initial value problems. They are first order in time. So you'll need the initial values of all your variables. And then once you have that, then you can take time steps and go forward in time. So um, uh, Harold in his lectures is talking about um, boundary value problems. Uh, and I decided, um, uh, I wanted to focus in on initial value problems. So these might be the kind of equations you would use to evolve merging black holes. But you would have to solve the general relativity analog of constraints. This is just one. You would have to solve constraints to create the initial data your evolution starts from. And those are boundary value problems like what Harold's talking about. So there's, there's both involved, but I'm gonna focus on this kind. Great question. Other questions? Okay, so I have a question for you. And that question is, the, the choices are going to be just A is yes, B is no, and C 
it depends. And the question is, if you take, don't worry about the constraint for now, if you take this, the scalar wave system of equations in first order form, as I've written it here, if you take this system of equations, is it or can it be put in this general form or not? So let's think about that and then we'll vote. Let me ask the question again, since I didn't write it down. Is this system of equations like this? Is it that form? Yes or no? And while you think about it, I'm just gonna expand out this divergence here. So I'm gonna make it partial X by X. Just, just to be clear. Unless anyone would like some more time to think, which is always cool. Prepare your votes. And hold up your votes. Okay. Okay. Good. Put your votes down. There was a majority opinion, which I won't say was right or wrong yet, but a substantial minority. So talk to someone on the other side of you, convince them why you're right, and make sure if you both agree, you both agree for the right reason and you're on both wrong. Take about 30 to 60 seconds. Yes. Oh, yeah, I should clarify both of these that the, the fluxes in this form and the sources are allowed to depend on the variables, just not their derivatives. Okay. Let's come back together and see if you came to a consensus or not as a class. Prepare your votes one more time and hold up your votes. Okay. Go ahead and put your votes down. Let's talk about this a little bit more. Let's try to compare, look at some of these terms and figure out where in this form they would go. So the time derivatives, let's see. Each equation has a first time derivative in it. So that's good. So this term, yeah, they're at least like that. Okay, and let's talk about, let's talk about the source term. Do any of these equations have a, a source term of something that depends on the variables, but no derivatives? Yeah, I hear people saying pi, this one right here. Exactly. So. That's an example of a source term. Do any of the other equations have non-zero source terms? Yes or no? Yes. 
Does this one have any non-zero source terms? No. How about this one? How about any of them except for this one? No, they only have derivatives. This is the only non-zero source term. So in fact, if we tried to put this system in that form, here's u alpha, sure. And then we could also write s alpha is equal to, and we'll write them in order. So for the time derivative of the g equation, s alpha is equal to what? Minus pi. So minus pi for the g equation. I'm sorry that this is in a different order than I wrote them here. For the g equation, the source term is minus pi, and we just agreed the source term is zero for the others. Now, this isn't really, and remember, alpha is just labeling. There is one equation per variables, and, and this is just the source term in each of them. So that part's good. So we're good here, and we're good here. Now, the question is, are the remaining derivatives in this form? What kind of a mathematical operation is this? Divergence. So in order to be in this form, all remaining spatial derivatives had better be divergences. Let's start here. Is this a divergence? Partial x phi x plus partial y phi y plus partial z phi z. Is that the, does that fit the definition of a divergence? Yes. What about partial x pi? No, these do not. So you can actually not write the system of equations in this form because there are derivatives that are not divergences, or you can also think of it as the principal part is not a, a continuity equation, a conservation law. This system is non-conservative in that sense because of these terms. As a result, the correct answer to this question is in fact B. No, you can't. You can't use this form when you want to do the scalar wave. I'm making a big deal about that, about this wave equation. I said scalar just because the amplitude in this case is a scalar. Um, it turns out there's the same exact uh, feature in the equations for general relativity in the formulation that we use in spec and specter, the generalized harmonic formulation is called. It's the same issue. It is not conservative. Now that's a big deal as it, as it turns out. I mentioned earlier, you want to put equations in this form um, if you're doing hydrodynamics. The reason for that is if you have shocks, which are sharp features. I think you talked a lot last week when I wasn't here, but I heard you talked about shock capturing is issues with, with hydro, hydrodynamics. So if you want to get the shocks correct and want to get the shock speeds correct and so on, then writing the equations in this form turns out to be very important. However, if the equations are smooth, then it's okay to have, I mean, if the solutions are smooth and have no sharp features, no shocks, then it's okay to have non-conservative terms as well. It turns out in general relativity, there are no sharp features, no shocks. You can't have a cube black hole with light to sharp corners or something like that. There's no, there's no sharp features. So for both the wave equation and for general relativity, it turns out it is okay that our equations can't be put in this form. So to generalize this form, what are we going to need? We're going to need, and I'm gonna use a different color because this applies just for the wave equation. We'll see if this one, well, green on green. I don't know, man, is that gonna show up? Yeah, okay. Plus. Now we need a term like this, bi alpha beta partial i u beta. So what this is, these are, these are the coefficients of the partial derivatives of each variable. So basically you're allowed to have some term proportional to the partial derivative of each variable in your equation. And this is no longer flux conservative. If the only, terms you have are these, then this is in one of these flux balanced forms where the whole thing is a conservation law and you can handle the shocks. But, but with these extra terms, these are non-conservative. Yeah. Uh, in classical mechanics, uh, I have got the first derivative of uh, something like if I have the velocity term yeah. that, uh, in an equation of motion, then that generally uh, behaves like a friction term. 
Okay. So is the first derivative of space, it's also like a picture term? Ah, that's an interesting question. I've never thought about that. I mean, I'm using the phrase non-conservative in the sense that the variable principal part doesn't obey a conservation law. Uh, so it's uh, analogous in that sense, maybe, but I don't know. I've never really quite thought about it that way. But you can think of this term as even if the sources are all zero, the variable does not obey some conservation law. Can we say it like this sentence? Can we say it like this sentence? It's not similar to the continuity. Yeah, this system of equations is not similar. I mean, not. I'm not using similar in like a formal mathematical sense, but it's not the same kind of system as the continuity equation because it has these non-conservative terms. Non-conservative terms. Okay. Other questions? All right. So the last thing I wanna do Oh, yes. Oh, sure. Sorry, I didn't see you. Um, I'm not using that term in terms of conservation of energy. I mean, if you, you, we know what the solution to the wave equation is, and, you know, that does obey conservation of energy of a wave going out, and there's no, there's no dissipation here in this wave. It's just a, a traveling wave. So I don't mean it in the sense of conservation of energy. I mean it in the sense that the variables that I'm evolving don't obey local conservation laws. They don't obey equations of this form. So this triangle, this is R is going to write kind of specific derivatives of RBS, sources. Why can't you treat the spatial derivatives as sources is a question and just absorb them in here? Well, let me think how to, how to answer that. I think, I think what I would say is the idea when you want to actually solve these equations numerically is the structure of what kinds of derivatives are in the equations tells you how the system behaves. In particular, the presence of this term and the fluxes will be crucial in telling you what happens at the boundaries between uh, cells when you have cells or elements. So, I mean, you could always define things and hide the derivatives in another term if you wanted, but it doesn't change the fact that those derivatives are there and they change the structure of what kinds of, uh, what kind of terms you'll need in your solution. That'll become more clear when we actually do this discontinuous Glurkin spatial discretization. Um, but for now, you just have to take it, take it on faith temporarily that, that the, the, it, I'm writing this in terms of where the derivatives are because where the derivatives are tells you what kind of equation you have. Interesting question, though. Yeah. I have just one pattern that is one space in it. Yes. So I'm not missing any divergence of space. Okay, that's that's a really interesting corner case question. What if this was in one D? In one D, there's no difference between divergences and everything else. So, well, I think I think this whole idea breaks down in one D, <laughs> like the distinction, like, because there's no difference. Everything's you know, there's just one dimension. And this comes back to what I was just saying, because it turns out the re what those, what these terms and these terms matter for is what's happening at the boundary. So if I have a computational domain with two elements and some boundary between them here, then those terms, as I'll show later on, are going to influence what's going from one cell to the other across the boundary. How is information propagating or how is um, mass propagating maybe, or whatever, whatever conserved quantity. But in one dimension, I get, you still technically have boundaries, but the boundaries are just points. It's not a clear way how you would do a, like a surface integral or something. So I think this whole, this whole distinction matters in 2D and 3D in a clearer way. I mean, at least I've not thought about that question before because um, we don't normally do, do 1D when we're doing like black holes, but it's an interesting question. Other questions before we go on? Okay, the last thing I want to do is just before we, we finish up 
talking about the scalar wave equation is it turns out there's going to be three terms like this. There's going to be B X alpha beta B Y. Oops, I'm running the Y up just because there's so many indices and B Z alpha and beta. And I want to show for at least one of these, how you actually figure out what they are. They're all, they all actually look kind of the same, but let's actually try to figure out what BX alpha beta is. And the way to figure that out is to figure out what do all those numbers have to be? So when I multiply beta X alpha beta by the derivatives, the spatial derivatives of the variables, I get back the right terms in the equation. So let's think about this for a second. First of all, there are two indices here, alpha and beta. So like what kind of mathematical object do you, do you think you would think of BX alpha beta as? If it has two indices, what could you picture it as? Yeah, it's a matrix. So let's write out this matrix. So there's two indices, alpha and beta. The alpha labels which equation we're talking about, which row here we're talking about. So let's make alpha, when I write this matrix, let's make alpha go along here. So each row is like which equation we're talking about. And then the columns, the beta, are going to be which partial derivatives we have. So let's start with the G equation. The top left corner, if beta is going this way, the top left corner is going to be the coefficient in the equation partial tg of partial xg. Is there a partial derivative of x with respect to, with respect to the g in, the, in that first equation? No, there's actually no partial derivatives at all. So my five rows are going to, the, the rows are going to be corresponding to the equations or the derivatives of g pi pi x. Sorry, this is leaking up into the, where there's glare phi y and phi z, and similarly over here. So these are the coefficients of all these partial derivatives to left more space. Sorry about that. And then these are gonna be the co which equation. So in fact, the top row is all zeros, right? Okay, let's look at the pi equation next. In the pi equation, the matrix B X alpha beta, we only care about X derivatives. Are there any partial X derivatives in here that you see? In this equation, is there a partial X of anything? Yeah, partial X of phi X. And what's the coefficient of that term in this equation? It's just one. So we come over to the partial, oh, and these are all, I wrote partial I's, these are all partial X's because we're only dealing with the X derivatives in this matrix. And so partial X phi X had better get a one. And there are no other derivatives in there. So the rest of those are zero. So this was the G equation, the partial T G equation, the partial T phi equation. Now we have three more. These bottom two don't have any partial X's in them. So those are all gonna be zero. And now let's see, what about this one? This one has a partial X in it and the coefficient is, is just, just one. So then this would be zero, zero, one. Did I get all those? I'm not sure I got all those right. Let me... Yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's right because the partial derivative, the, this equation for partial T of phi X is row three. And then the spatial derivative in there is also partial X phi X. So this is right. Yeah. Have I already accounted for the partial derivatives? Yeah, so the partial derivatives of phi show up in the partial T pi equation, 
and I put a one in that equation, partial t pi has a partial x phi x, and then partial x of pi, oh, yeah, 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 because it's not a derivative of phi, it's a derivative of pi. All right, is that, is that better? Ah, I had a typo in my notes. Okay, good. Yeah, did I mess something up? What? Yes, one, one, and then this one corresponds to the time derivative pi equation has a partial x partial phi, and this one, oh, I guess you wanted a different color. This one is here, and then this is um, partial t phi x. Is that, is that right? Partial t phi x has a partial x pi, yes? And partial x phi x in the partial t pi equation. Okay, so there's two non-zero terms in there. All right, so sorry, I, admit, I flipped some around. So the point is you could go through for the y derivatives and fill in all the numbers for this and the z derivatives and fill in all the numbers for this. And for this system, it turns out, these are actually pretty simple and it's mostly zeros. Each one will have two ones and all the rest will be zeros. Okay. So I wanted to show you this just, uh, just so that you understand when we start treating this abstractly and we're just dealing with Bs and Us and Ss and Fs, that these terms, like they're just real things that you can read off your system of equations once you have it. Are there any other questions before we move on? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it'll only satisfy the equation with this, because even if I didn't write all these out, what the third equation would be is it would be partial t phi plus a gradient, not a divergence. It only fits this flux balanced form if the only spatial derivatives are divergences. And in the scalar wave system, there are derivatives that are gradients, not divergences. So in that case, that case, no, but you could collapse these three down to one vector equation if you wanted. That, that's definitely true. It's a good, good point. I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. Thanks for asking about that. Other questions? Yes. At least for a flat space case, we don't try the last three equations. In terms of, let's say, we can imagine three matrix in such a way that by uh, yeah, yeah. So you could collapse these three equations into th this form that I wrote here, which is just standing, just one vector equation. That's true. Uh, this could be a flux because it's a divergence. These aren't, and even if you put these together, they're still not. So I think what you're saying is, could I like add these equations together maybe, but it's still not a divergence because pi is a scalar. So I don't, I don't quite understand what the, what the idea would be. So what I'm trying to say is you can, you could always write this partial x of pi, partial y of pi, partial v of pi as partials on the identity matrix with pi, which would in, 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 a, in a sense mean that you're given a vector, a vector to a, okay. Um, you're, you're multiplying uh, unit vectors, but it's pi. I, if I understand what you're saying, maybe we should talk more afterwards. I mean, you can make it look in different forms, but the variables you're gonna end up solving for, this, the derivative structure is what it is, and that's not gonna change. So can we like write it in the third equation? Yeah. And then we add a term like zero into 10 y pi. 
Can we add a term to the third equation that's what? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So plus zero into del. Oh, oh, oh. So like plus zero. Uh, even then, it's not a divergence because pi isn't a vector. So, so I don't think that would work. I mean, you could add a divergence times zero, but then that's just the same as saying these fluxes are zero. So it's not that these, I mean, it, it, as you like, you can either say these terms aren't there or you can say they're zero. For the scalar wave, the fluxes, you can take the fluxes as zero. I mean, maybe you could decide to treat this as a flux, but usually since there's non-conservative terms anyway, we want it. And I just put all the derivatives in here. But I guess the only flexibility you have is since this one does happen to be a divergence, you could technically put that one over here instead, but the system of equations is the same and it would all work out the same. All right. I really appreciate these questions about, about uh, corner and edge cases and could you try to work your way around, around things here. So the reason I wanted to spend as much time as I have an hour of the first lecture here is so that when I write down this generic form of the first order time derivatives, first order space derivatives, set of differential equations that we're going to do discontinuous Glurkin on, that you would have a feel for what these terms are. There are not, the derivative terms include non-conservative terms, they include flux terms and time derivatives, and then there's also source terms. So I'm going to leave this here, even if I have to start erasing other things and run out of board before the end of the, the, the lecture, because this is going to be our starting point for doing the discontinuous Glurkin. Okay, so in the last 30 minutes, I think what we're gonna end up doing is we will start the main discontinuous Glurkin discussion, but we're, we're not gonna finish it today. So I'm gonna start setting up what the idea is, and then we'll finish working through the math next, next time tomorrow. Okay, so the starting point for discontinuous Glurkin is the same starting point um, as in Harold's lectures, you, you could say. It's spatial discretization. The idea is we would like, we have a system of partial differential equations that are all initial value problems, and we would like to convert them to ordinary differential equations because there's a whole slew of methods for solving ordinary differential equations that are initial value problems. You know, there's methods to take, solve them like, um, you know, like Runga Kutta is an example of a way to, to do this kind of problem. So we would like, like to turn the, uh, we would like to take this and end up with a set of equations with only one variable. Now there's a name for this idea of taking partial differential equation systems, getting rid of all the derivatives, but one kind of derivative, and now, then treating it as an ordinary system of differential equations. And the name for this idea is called the method of lines. If you ever hear, hear that phrase. And what that means is, if you've got a system of equations with four different derivatives, partial t, partial x, partial y, and partial z here, then if you could make some kind of approximation to turn three of those derivatives into algebraic things instead of derivatives, then all you have left are time derivatives. Now, in principle, with the method of lines, we can pick any derivative you want to be the one that you're integrating over as ordinary differential equations. You could get rid of the t's, y, and z derivatives, and then you'd have a set of ordinary differential equations in x. But time is different than space in, in relativity. And, and so normally in physics, when we do the method of lines, the natural thing to do is to leave the time derivatives and you have ordinary differential equations that are functions of time. So the, the way that we are gonna do the method of lines is spatial discretization. Okay, so we're gonna do spatial discretization. Discontinuous Glurkin is one way to handle turning all those spatial derivatives into numerical derivatives. It's actually very closely connected to the spectral methods that Harold's been talking about. In fact, spectral methods can be understood as, uh, as a, uh, can be understood from this point of view. Uh, uh, so 
There are some little technical things that would be different between a spectral method like um, what you would do in, uh, in just traditional, like a pseudo spectral code, like the spectral Einstein code in DG, but, but the, the basic ideas are very, are very similar. Okay, so what I'm gonna show you how to do today and into the next lecture is how to take this generic system of equations and, and um, spatially discretize it, get rid of the spatial derivatives. How do we do that? Well, to start out, we have to talk about what space we're gonna be working on. Now, I haven't said what that is. Um, I'm gonna draw a sketch. Basically, I'm gonna sketch an imaginary computational domain. Now, the shape of your domain is gonna be different for different problems. Suppose you wanted to solve not the scalar wave equation, but the generalized harmonic formulation of the Einstein equations, which looks a little like this, just with lots more messy terms in it. Then one domain you might imagine is, what if I had a black hole? And I just wanted, for starters, to keep things simple, have a domain with a single black hole. Well, maybe I'll make the, the space that I want to solve everything on, maybe I'll make that a sphere. So imagine we've got ourselves a sphere. But black holes have singularities in them, and singularities are bad for numerical methods. So in this kind of approach, the way you deal with singularities is a little different than the moving puncture stuff that, uh, uh, because in finite difference codes, you can just turn grid points on and off if the puncture gets close to it. But here, because these are, this is also gonna be like the spectral methods involving sums over basis functions. You can't turn off individual coefficients in the series expansion. So what we actually do is there's just some region where the singularity lives that we just remove. So the computational domain is everything in here for a single black hole. For a binary black hole, I'm just gonna draw a tiny sketch and you would do that twice. And there's a singularity in there and in there. And so it's just the space in between that's your domain. All right. Now in discontinuous Galerkin methods, like in spectral methods, you divide up the volume into a bunch of, of sub, uh, subsets of the full space. Now in finite element analysis, these uh, individual cells would be called elements. I'm gonna call them elements as well. Um, sometimes you might call them cells. Sometimes you might call them in uh, the spectral Einstein code, we call them subdomains. But the basic idea is we're going to divide this up into a bunch of little elements. And so I'm gonna just divide the space up. You got a picture, it's a sphere, but I'm not gonna try to draw the 3D. That's, that's gonna be bad if I try to do that. And so now each one of these things here, that I'll shade in one of them, each one of these is a little chunk of volume that's one element. Now it turns out, if you look at this closely enough, you can realize that each element, and this is true for lots of different shapes of elements, not just the ones I drew here. This is the space and you could imagine doing a transformation to it, a continuous transformation to map that into a cube. This one, I'm tempted to draw it in 3D, but I don't want to try. But the idea is ultimately you can think of each of these cells as a cube, as long as you have a map that takes that cube and turns it into whatever actual deformed shape the element has. Now, I, I am gonna draw the cube in 3D. And so I guess I'll try to draw one of those little elements in 3D. So the notation I'm gonna use is the coordinates in the actual space that I'm evolving are going to be X, whoops, X, no, I think I did that right, X, Y, and Z. And I will write the coordinates in general as X, I. Those are the coordinates in the real space. Um, this is a re reference frame that's inertial, say, or at least asymptotically inertial. And, and so this is, these, this is the physical space. And then this is the logical space. You can imagine each of these can be related to a cube. 
and the coordinates in the cube I'll call psi, eta, and zeta. And together I'll call their vector psi i. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you ask that again, please? Yeah. So the question is, would this still be possible if you had a shell instead of a bunch of little, little things like this? Um, you would have to generalize this. So here I'm doing the assumption that Spectre does, which is that every element is hexahedral, which means it's, it's at least a topological cube and you can do some kind of mapping like this. If you had a continuous spherical shell, then it's connected, the connections are different. And, and you can't just turn a spherical shell into a cube like that. You, now you could imagine having some generalization to deal with it, but I'm going to assume that's not the case. And we're always gonna divide our domain into hexahedral elements like this. That's a great question. Thanks for asking about that. And in particular, in this frame, the coordinates always go from minus one to one along each dimension. Minus one to one, minus one to one, and minus one minus one in the third dimension to one, I guess you could say. So there's some origin in there. So the reason all the axes go from minus one to one is because, is because we're going to do series expansions of the solution on this cube in terms of these orthogonal polynomials, like what you were learning about in the earlier session today. And by having the element have the same domain as these special orthogonal polynomials from minus one to one, that just makes our life doing the basis, the series expansion easier. It makes a natural choice for what those functions are going to be. Now there's a map that goes from the logical frame and, and the coordinates psi i, there's a map that goes from here to the physical frame. And there's an inverse to that map that goes from here back to the logical frame where you could write psi i as a function of x i. So this is the first idea of how in DG, we're, at least in the, the way I'm gonna talk about it, we're going to discretize the volume. We're gonna divide it up into a bunch of six-sided elements. Now they don't have to be cubes. There can be a map that deforms them so you can have things like spherical shells. We're gonna focus the discussion on just one of these elements, and then you could do the same thing for all of the elements. I'm going to introduce some notation. Each element, just like on my slides yesterday, if you remember, is gonna be labeled omega and with a number. And I'm gonna consider one element, the kth element. And so I'll call that omega k. So now that we've got our space divided up into a bunch of elements, we're going to need to do something for each element to get rid of the spatial derivatives. Yes. Oh, good question. So I said this is 3D, and the question is, is this a cylinder or a sphere? I'm imagining this is a sphere because a non-spinning black hole would be spherical. But just like what Harold was saying this morning, it's the exact same story. You need to choose the shape of your domain to conform to the underlying symmetry of the problem to get good results and get those great convergence rates. So for a black hole, even a spinning one, it's mostly a sphere. So a spherical domain or maybe a deformed spherical domain can do even better to match the shape of the horizon, say. That's what you want. If you had some kind of cylindrical system, uh, some kind of curved space-time that was cylindrical, then it would make more sense to do that. Now, there's a correction to that, which is here I designed the domain to be shaped so the outer boundary is like a sphere. I mean, in principle, you could have the outer boundary shaped however you want, but since we're usually just wanting a surface that's very far away and far away, gravity looks like one over R and looks kind of spherically symmetric. Normally in these numerical simulations, you'd use a sphere, but in principle, you could do something else except dealing with the corners if you had like a cubicle outer boundary that might introduce extra complexities. Uh, normally, the way we're gonna do the boundary conditions, you would want a sphere. It's not impossible, at least I don't think in principle, it's impossible to evolve one of these things on a cube, but then 
there'd be extra complications. Like, what do you do for the outer boundary at the corners? And I don't want to worry about that. I'm not saying you couldn't do it. Maybe you could, but it, it'd be extra work and nobody does in practice when you're doing this kind of method. Good question. Yeah, so the, the cube always has all of its coordinates bounded at minus one to one because that fits the orthogonal polynomials we're going to use to do series expansions on it. And then to get back to the real physical domain, whatever that is, you just take your results on this logical cube and transform it to get the spatial dependence of everything in the real deformed element. So what if we have yeah, you, you could do that. This is an example for a spherical domain, but another example, I'm only going to draw this in 2D. Suppose you had this logical cube. So this is psi and eta. And suppose you have a logical square, because I'm doing this in 2D now. And suppose your map just turned it into a brick. Yes, that's something you could do. And later on, when we actually play with some domains, if, uh, and put them up on the screen and, and uh, play, look at some domains from Spectre in 3D, then that's an example. So you don't have to use a mapping that turns them into curved things. You could, but you're also free to create some domains like, like this. Yes? So, uh, how exactly are so while like, translating it to the logical cube, does every single cube follow the same coordinates or does it depending on the individual? That's a good question. Does this mapping, is it the same mapping for throughout the entire domain? And the answer is in practice for this example, it can be because all the all the it's just one sphere. But this problem in there will be regions with different mappings because there might be. I'll draw a bigger version. There might be a region around each black hole where you try to do a sphere thing like this. And then there's a region out here where you also break it up in the same way. But then in between, this doesn't have that shape. So you're going to have to have some other mapping. So usually there's some line down there. And then you're going to have some shapes here that, that are different. So in general, we usually use the same mapping in certain regions of the code, but then you can change the mapping. It's not necessarily the same mapping everywhere in the domain. For this simple example, it could be because it, it's all just one shape. Ah, great question. This is totally separate from conformal flatness. The idea of conformal flatness is suppose you have a spatial geometry or space time geometry, we'll say a spatial geometry, G, I, j and you have another spatial geometry g tilde ij that you make up well the real spatial metric might if it's related by this kind of conformal transformation that's just a way of saying the metric you care about is proportional to this one you made up and this is something you do when you construct binary black hole initial data conformal transformations uh, preserve angles in some sense um, uh, but this kind of transformation doesn't necessarily preserve angles because you're deforming the cube potentially. Um, so it's not exactly a conformal transformation and it doesn't have to do with the initial value problem. It's just a mapping where it's called just a coordinate mapping where you start out with coordinates that are well suited for your orthogonal polynomials and transform it into coordinates that are well suited for the underlying physical quantities you're trying to model. What is the outermost what? Sorry. What is the outermost boundary? Oh, how far out is it? That's a great question. It depends. I mean, it's, it's your choice. When you're doing a problem like this, depending on what boundary condition you want to put there, the outer boundary could be farther or not. Like if you're doing a single black hole and you know what the solution is, you could use a Dirichlet condition to set the outer boundary to the solution you know, and then keep it very nearby. In practice, for the binary black hole problems that we do, um, the, the boundary conditions that we use to try to keep the constraints that I mentioned earlier from blowing up tend to only work well when they're sufficiently far out. 
So usually um, in simulations we'd run, this outer boundary would be something like hundreds to order a thousand times the black hole sizes. Yes. Not necessarily. You could do a transformation like this, where you turn the cube into a brick and length isn't conserved either. It's just, uh, these could be some kind of, basically, I mean, as long as it's not changing the topology, you can stretch and deform these in different ways. Yeah. Um, so this is just a way of mapping from, so the reason we have this mapping at all is the arrangement of coordinates that does a good job matching the symmetry of the physical solution, which is what you want in order to have that good exponential convergence, is not necessarily the same as the coordinates that your orthogonal polynomials are defined on. And so you start here, and then you map it to, to the distribution that'll give you the nice convergence. Okay. So, I guess it's worth mentioning at this stage that once we have these elements, on each element, we're going to do the same exact thing as uh, Harold was saying in the spectral methods. So for instance, you have a solution of a bunch of variables, u alpha, and each u alpha, you can expand as a sum. I'm going to call it, use uh, indices with these little briefs, these upside down u's on them to label, um, label this kind of expansion. You could expand the u's in terms of some coefficients times some basis functions. In one dimension, those basis functions might be just functions of one of these logical variables. In three dimensions, you would do something more complicated where you would have basis functions on all three of these coordinates, which I've called psi and eta and zeta, but for now we can just think about one dimension. Um, if you, or you could just say, you know what, I don't even care for right, <coughs> right now. <coughs> these basis functions just depend on, um, these are the only things that depend on space. And so you could write this basis function as a function of all the size, or you could put it through the mapping and say, since it depends on psi, it also depends on the x's. But either, either way, whether you're thinking of it as an expansion here or here, for now, we don't need to necessarily worry about what these are. These are just some basis functions that you know in advance, you choose them. So the idea is you expand the solution, u, you expand its time derivatives, you expand the fluxes, you expand the source terms, you expand the non-conservative terms, all those terms you expand using an expansion like this. But because it's a numerical method, we're not really going to expand it to infinity. We're really going to expand it to some truncated at some finite order. Now all Harold sums we're doing n minus one. And I thought about trying to call that n minus one, but you know, the, the notes I prepared for the whole week used N and I didn't think I could get them all right without making mistakes in my notes. So I'm gonna disagree with Harold's convention. The important thing here is the sum doesn't go on forever. You have to stop it at some point. Um, if I had it to all over again, I would have done the N minus one, but that, that ship sailed. Okay, so with that in mind, this is getting us to the gist of the discontinuous Galerkin idea. So what I'm gonna to, going to do in the last 10 minutes, I don't have time to do the whole derivation. So we'll do the main derivation next week, but I'll just give you the gist of how you set it up and what, what kind of things you end up with. So, and I guess I don't wanna go any farther that way. So the gist is the starting point is you take this system of equations, and you do two things. First, you multiply it by one of your basis functions, and then you integrate. So what's the idea here? How does that look? So let's just choose out of this whole summation, let's just choose one basis function phi 
I breathe here. This, this uh, phi, I'll just not say the breathe all the time, phi sub i. Let's just choose one of those basis functions. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take our generic equation. And I guess I've got some room here, so I'll write it again. But this time, what we're going to do is we're going to integrate this equation after multiplying it by the basis function. So what you're going to get is partial t u alpha. And remember, there's a whole bunch of these equations. We're going to do it for each value of alpha, u alpha, plus the flux term. It's a divergence of some flux alpha plus the non-conservative term b i alpha beta uh, times the partial derivative, the gradient partial i of u beta minus the source term. And this whole thing is equal to zero. Now, all I've done so far is just rewrite the equation. If this whole thing is zero, you're always free to multiply that whole thing by one of these basis functions. And that's still zero because the thing in the square brackets is zero. And then you're also free to integrate this. Oh, sorry, I tried to over the element. So what I'm doing is I'm integrating, and for now I wrote d cubed x because I'm imagining integrating here in the deformed cube, d cubed x. So you integrate over the volume of your cell. That is the first step. You multiply by one of the basis functions and integrate over the cell. And then the gist of what happens next is you can expand each term in a summation like this. And then you will end up with a bunch of products of phi's. You'll have like a phi sub i times a phi sub j, things like that. And this is a way, and then you can end up factoring out all of the, um, all of the spatial dependence into some spatial integrals that you know how to do because you know what the basis functions are. And what's left behind will be an ordinary differential equ equation system. Now there's more to it that I'm not gonna go into until next time. You will, there will be integration by parts because this is theory, there's always integration by parts. And in, in this case, the integration by parts will be how we handle the discontinuity in discontinuous Galerkin. Discontinuous Galerkin allows the solutions to not be continuous across boundaries. And the way we handle that has to do with the specific boundary conditions between the elements. And, uh, and so there's an extra step besides what I sort of outlined. I'm gonna leave it here and say, what we're gonna do next time, just as a preview, is take our generic system of equations, now that we talked about what it is and what it means, multiply by some of our basis functions, which I won't yet choose, that'll come later. And then we will do this volume integral, do some math and work out this actual system of ordinary differential equations, including the boundary corrections or bound that control what happens at the interior boundaries. We'll work that whole thing out next time. Are there any other questions about anything we did today? If not, thank you very much for participating, and I won't stand between you and lunch. We can end a few minutes early.